Andrew C. Skinner, besides being a good friend, is also a professor of ancient scripture at the university. He earned degrees in theology, Jewish studies, Near Eastern and European history. And he's written stuff on American history, if you can believe this, for an ancient guy. I mean, a guy who was interested in ancient things. Dr. Skinner taught at the University of Colorado and Ricks College, has filled four assignments at the BYU Jerusalem Center. He has served as the Dean of Religious Education at BYU, and Executive Director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. He is the author, co-author, of over 200 publications on the Bible, including Gethsemane, Jerusalem, the Eternal City, and New Testament Apostles Testify of Christ, and verse by verse, the four Gospels. His areas of skill and expertise are the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew language, Dead Sea Scrolls, Ancient Near Eastern History, U.S. military history, and Aramaic. I have some questions about Aramaic for you. <clears throat> His New Testament commentary publication will be the Book of Acts, co-authored with John Welch. The title of his presentation today is, as you can see, The Ark of the Ministry of John the Baptist, whose coming we celebrate today. Brother Skinner. Thank you. It's a real privilege and a pleasure for me to be here and to be associated with such fine scholars. I mean that sincerely. I have two prefacing comments. Uh, number one, I asked Richard Draper what order of presenter he was, and he said he's the very last, the dessert, uh, which in Greek is afikomen, if you're familiar with that term from the Passover meals, which means the very last thing to be eaten. By that reckoning, I am the after-dinner nap. And I, uh, but my second comment is if you uh, we'll stay awake. I uh, do welcome critiques and uh, and uh, comments. Helps to make our knowledge of John the Baptist uh, better. So uh, I hope that, uh, that that would be the case. I think it's fair to say that few personalities have as prominent a role in both the primitive and restored Gospels of Jesus Christ as John the Baptist. The arc of his ministry, that is to say, the breadth and depth of his involvement in God's plan truly is stunning. Foreordained to perform his unique service, promised to a childless couple by the angel messenger Gabriel, firstborn son of pure Aaronite parentage, possessing family ties to the mortal family of the Messiah, ordained to his revolutionary task at eight days of age, his probable involvement with the Qumran community by the Dead Sea, proclaiming forceful and blunt messages to his Jewish audiences, unretreatingly contending with Jewish leadership, performing ritual ablutions by total immersion, baptizing his relative, Jesus of Nazareth, the very Messiah, training a cadre of followers and subsequently transferring their personal allegiance from himself to Jesus, forerunner to and witness of Jesus as the Messiah, endorsed by the Messiah himself as one of the greatest prophets, but also more than a prophet, his authorship of written records, his stalwart defense of moral behavior, and his forthright condemnation of Herod Antipas's behavior, his subsequent beheading by that same Herod at Machaerus, east of the Dead Sea, his appearance on the Mount of Transfiguration as a disembodied spirit, his continuing reputation some 20 or more years after his death, his resurrection and appearances to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery and others, all of these occurrences and more make John one of the greatest and indeed busiest biblical characters ever to have lived. He was a pivotal figure in three dispensations of God's plan for his children. We believe that John the Baptist was foreordained to do what he did 
before he was born into mortality, and that his ministry was outlined ahead of time in heaven. The pre-Meridian prophets could not have said so much about John if he and his ministry were not carefully orchestrated long before he came to earth. Joseph Smith said, as you will remember, every man who has a calling to minister to the inhabitants of the world was ordained to that very purpose in the grand council of heaven before the world was, unquote. Surely, John fits the description of those premortal spirits that were shown to Father Abraham in a sweeping vision of pre-earth life. As the great patriarch stated, quote, Now the Lord had shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was, and among all of these were many noble, many of the noble and great ones. John the Baptist, by anyone's reckoning, was a noble and great one. We possess uh, not only biblical, but also non-biblical sources that elucidate John's life and times. Especially notable is the Jewish historian Josephus, who is regarded in some moderly, modern scholarly circles as of greater value than Matthew or Luke. See, for example, the article on John the Baptist in Erdman's Dictionary of the Bible. One believes, at least I believe, and I think others do too, that this is true in large part due to a profound distrust of sources reporting supernatural events. By contrast, Latter-day Saints express gratitude for and frankly revel in the rich treasure trove of revealed sources about John the Baptist, including Matthew and Luke, which we embrace to better understand the mark of the man, John the Baptist. Ancient predecessors to who prophesied of John or his ministry include Isaiah, Lehi, Nephi, and Gabriel or Noah. In addition, we gain valuable insights about John's life from some of his latter-day successors, including Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. The earliest allusion to John the Baptist seems to be Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, which originated perhaps in the 8th century BC. From the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, which New Testament disciples knew of, and from which New Testament writers quoted, we read the following. The voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths of our God. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and all the crooked places shall become straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall appear and all flesh shall, shall see the salvation of God for the Lord has spoken it. The synoptic authors each interpret this passage as a prophecy referring to John. For this is the one spoken of through Isaiah the prophet saying, Prepare the way, Greek odon, of the Lord, make straight his paths. The Gospel of John, however, presents the Baptist himself, quoting Isaiah to the priests and Levites that were sent by the Pharisees, and he does so as an affirmation of his credentials. And they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, or perhaps even better yet, shouting in the wilderness. Greek, boontos, uh, fits better the context. What you would do in the wilderness to, to grab somebody's attention is to shout. And that seems to be the context of John's 
mission, there's also an, an implication that there are not a lot of people listening or paying attention as he's crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. That's John chapter 1, verse 23. In addition, Mark's gospel ultimately testifies that the prophet Malachi also spoke of John the Baptist in a quotation of disputed origin. Many Greek manuscripts have Mark attributing the quotation to Isaiah, but other ancient authorities read in the prophets, which is the King James reading. The problematic passage reads as follows. Even as, his, even as it has been written in the prophet Isaiah, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare you. That's Mark chapter 1, verse 2. Clearly, this passage appears to be taken from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, and not Isaiah. Later on, Matthew and Luke report that Jesus used this quotation in declaring John's greatness without attributing, attributing it to a specific source. Quote, Jesus began to say to the crowds concerning John, this is he about whom it has been written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way in front of you. That's Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 and 10. It's also found in Luke chapter 7. Though John the Baptist is not explicitly named in the Book of Mormon, discussions of his mission leave no doubt that he was known to those prophets. Like the Gospel authors, Lehi emphasized John's role as one who would prepare the way of the Lord. And uh, here I quote 1 Nephi chapter 10, 7 through 10, but knowing that you know it so well, we'll cut to the analysis. 600 years before John's time, Lehi foretold the very words John would speak, namely that the Messiah is mightier than I, whose shoes latch I am not worthy to unloose. We can make some comparisons between 1 Nephi chapter 10, verse 8 and the Gospels. Lehi predicted that John would baptize in Beit Abra beyond Jordan. Lehi noted John would baptize the Messiah with water. And finally, Lehi said that after John had baptized the Messiah, he would, quote, behold and bear record that he had baptized the Lamb of God. And we can compare 1 Nephi 10.10 10 with John chapter 1, verses 29 through 36. Lehi's Son Nephi saw a vision similar to his father's and clearly understood John's preparatory role, particularly his act of baptizing the Messiah. But apparently, unlike his father, he also viewed or at least reported that the descent of the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove was a witness. As a forerunner who would prepare the way of the Lord, making straight his paths and the rough places plain, John's prophesied actions harked back and paralleled the earlier ancient custom of kings and rulers sending forerunners ahead of their approach, ahead of the royal chariots and coaches in order to herald their coming and clear their path of rocks and other obstacles. This practice is documented in the Old Testament in the context of a warning against the adoption of kingship by the Israelites, the prophet Samuel described the manner of the king who would come to rule over Israel. He would take their sons for his chariots to be his horsemen, and some shall run before the chariots. That's 1 Samuel 8.11. When Adonijah exalted himself and plotted to become king, quote, he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him, 1 Kings 1.5. In other words, to have forerunners was a credential of royalty in the ancient world. It was a marker 
of kingship. And John was the forerunner of the great king. Uh, a third example, the prophet Isaiah also presents an illuminating image that coheres with his own previously described role of forerunner that was eventually applied to John. Quote, go through, go through the gates, prepare the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 10. Such then was John's role as a forerunner. John the Baptist's birth was heralded by the angel Gabriel, identified by Joseph Smith as the ancient patriarch Noah, and thus another Old Testament prophetic witness to John's foreordained ministry. According to the Gospel of Luke, John possessed a pure Aaronite lineage. His father, Zechariah, was a priest who, by law, had to be a descendant of Aaron, and his mother, Elizabeth, was a female descendant of Aaron, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. They are described as both being dikaioi, which in Greek is upright, righteous, just, or innocent, walking in all the commandments and ordinances, or even righteous acts, as one could translate it, of the Lord blameless. John's heritage as a son of the Mosaic law era was second to none, genealogically and spiritually. The miraculous nature of the announcement of John's conception and birth is a function of the advanced age and childlessness of his parents. Luke says that Zechariah belonged to the eighth of 24 divisions or groupings of priests. He is called the division of Abijah, which is the Hebrew pronunciation, or Abia in Greek. These divisions uh, were originally established by King David, as 1 Chronicles 24 tell us, tells us. And they allowed for weekly shifts of priests selected by lot to serve in the Jerusalem temple twice a year. The point, I think, is that because of the large number of priests and the selection process by lot, the opportunity for an individual to serve in the temple might well have been rare. And the implication is that John's appearance, John's selection and appearance in the temple was guided by God. Of course, Zacharias's duties included keeping the incense burning on the altar in front of the most holy place or the small incense altar that uh, was directly in front of the entrance to the Holy of Holies. He was to supply it with fresh incense, according to Exodus chapter 30. And so it is that at the hour of the incense offering, while a multitude of people is outside the temple, the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah and commands him not to be afraid. The Greek word used here can be translated as terrified out of one's wits, I suppose. And uh, that's not a bad description of how I would react if uh, the angel Gabriel appeared, and it seems to be so for Zechariah. And the, and the angel Gabriel says that Zechariah's prayer was heard, chapter 1 of Luke, verses 9 through 13. At this juncture, uh, it is interesting to note Uh, it's interesting to note that what the prophet Joseph Smith taught about Zacharias's entrance into the temple. He went there to wrestle with God for the blessing of a son. That was the prayer to which Gabriel referred. In the minute book of James Burgess, we read, quote, The priesthood was given to Aaron and his posterity through all generations. We can trace the lineage down to Zacharias he being the only lawful administrator in his day. And the Jews knew it well, for they always acknowledged the priesthood. Zacharias, having no children, knew that the promise of God must fail. Consequently, he went into the temple to wrestle with God according to the order of the priesthood to obtain a promise of a son. And when the angel told him that his promise was granted, he, because of unbelief, was struck dumb. 
There's a similar entry in the minute book of William McIntyre. And it's interesting that uh, other prophets have said, including Brigham Young, that when it comes to wrestling with God for a blessing, all of us are pretty much on the same ground. We must exert that much effort to receive the blessing that we desire. I find that very, very helpful. Uh, two, uh, these two statements help us to appreciate Gabriel's declaration. And of course, Gabriel made other significant pronouncements. The child was to be named John. His parents and many others would rejoice at his birth. He would in no way drink wine or strong drink. He would be great in the sight of the Lord. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit while in his mother's womb, according to Luke 1. Um, he would turn back many of the children of Israel to their Lord, which implies a condition of apostasy already in existence. He would be, um, he would go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elias. He would turn back the hearts of the fathers to their children. Interesting reference uh, that uh, projects us into our dispensation. He would make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Ironically, or at least I think it's ironic, Zechariah greeted Gabriel's pronouncement with skepticism. He went into the temple to wrestle for a blessing with God. And then when he was granted the very thing that he wrestled for, he questioned it. How many of us are like that? Gabriel's rejoinder carries something of the tone of, how dare you question me? As Gabriel said, I am Gabriel whose name in Hebrew, by the way, means strong man of God, the very one having stood before God and I was sent from God to speak to you. Zechariah was then struck mute until John's birth and the fact that people who wanted to communicate with John um, until, as it, they wanted to communicate with Zechariah until John was born had to make signs which suggests that he may have been rendered deaf as well. All of Gabriel's pronouncements were realized, beginning with John's fetal activity, as we heard this morning when the young Mary entered the house of Zachariah and Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth's baby leaped in her womb. The Greek word used in Luke 136 to describe Mary's relationship to Elizabeth is simply sugenis, relative or kinswoman and not necessarily cousin as the King James translates it. When the baby boy was born, he was given the name of John in opposition to uh, family members and neighbors who wanted him to be, named, be given a family name. And of course, John is a shortened form of the Hebrew name Yochanan, meaning Yahweh is gracious, which is a fairly common name in the Hellenistic period. The naming of John took place on the day he was circumcised, on the eighth day of his life. Modern revelation, of course, adds the, the stunning, unparalleled information that on the eighth day, John was also ordained by an angel of God unto this power to overthrow the kingdom of the Jews, to make straight the way of the Lord before the face of the people, to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. Thus, John's prophetically foretold ministry was confirmed to John by an ordinance in mortality. Some have wondered, I think, if this eight, eighth day ordination included receipt of the priesthood. The scriptural record is not clear, and there is a divergence of opinion. LDS apostle Bruce R. McConkie did not think it included receipt of the priesthood. Quote, in the case of John, he was ordained by an angel of God at the time he was eight days old, not to the Aaronic priesthood, for such would come later after his baptism and other preparation. That is, at this solemn eight-day ceremony, an angel, presumably Gabriel, gave the Lord's Elias the divine commission to serve as the greatest forerunner of all ages, unquote. On the other hand, LDS Church President Joseph Fielding Smith did think that John's ordination included the bestowal of the priesthood. 
The reason Zacharias could not ordain John is because of the fact that John received certain keys of authority which his father Zacharias did not possess. Therefore, this special authority had to be conferred by this heavenly messenger who was duly authorized and sent to confer it. John's ordination was not merely the bestowal of the Aaronic priesthood which his father held, but also the conferring of certain essential powers peculiar to to the time among which was the authority to overthrow the kingdom of the Jews to make straight the way of the Lord. Moreover, moreover, it was to prepare the Jews and other Israelites for the coming of the Son of God. This great authority required a special ordination beyond the delegated power that had been given to Zacharias or any other priest who went before him. So the angel of the Lord was sent to John in his childhood to confer it." Unquote. Concerning John's development, there's not a lot of information in the New Testament about John's growing up years. Some gaps are filled by apocryphal sources. Remember, Luke chapter 1, verse 80 says, quote, The child, meaning John, grew and was being strengthened in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his manifestation to Israel. This uh, parallels somewhat Luke's description of Jesus' development. He increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Matthew reports that Herod's encounter with the wise men exacerbated his paranoia and resulted in fear over perceived competition for his throne as there was a new king of the Jews afoot. Subsequently, Herod issued the edict to kill all of the male children in Bethlehem and all of its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he ascertained from the Magi. Uh, Jesus escaped the edict by being taken to Egypt. John, we are told in the Proto-Evangelium of James, escaped by hiding in Judean hills. And uh, this is the, the particular or the pertinent passage. I'm not going to read it but uh, it will be accessible on uh, the website, make things, make life a little easier. Possibly the passage uh, in the Proto-Evangelium was meant as interpretive commentary on Matthew 23. It may be the source behind Joseph Smith's statement where he talked about John's escape from Herod's treachery. <clears throat> Restoration scripture, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Restoration scripture tells us simply that John, who became known as the great baptizer, was himself baptized when he was yet in his childhood, section 84, verse 26. Also, we note that uh, Gabriel told Zechariah that John would never drink wine or strong drink. That phrase recalls the birth announcement made by another angel to another childless woman, the announcement of the birth of Samson. His mother was not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat ritually unclean food, for her child would, quote, be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Unquote. Judges chapter 13. When John emerged from his wilderness preparation, he was wearing clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. He had not eaten, nor had he drunk that which was forbidden. There is an apocryphal source, the Gospel of the Ebionites, which elaborates on John's diet. One of the lines that caught my attention was the one that talks about the wild honey. The, he, he consumed wild honey, the taste of which was that of manna, harking back to the ancient Israelites, or as cake dipped in oil. So all of you can go out and eat cake dipped in oil and know what John was eating. That, that was a joke. Um... Also concerning John's development, it's been proposed from time to time that John the Baptist was an Essene, or at least spent time growing up with the Essenes at the Dead Sea community of Qumran before breaking away from them on his own errand. 
I think I know what some of you are thinking at this point. Yeah, here's another Dead Sea Scroll guy telling us that the Dead Sea Scrolls saw all of the questions of the world, questions about John's childhood all the way up through the Kennedy assassination, but there is evidence to support this supposition. Evidence in, in favor Evidence in favor of a connection between John and the Essenes at Qumran includes several parallels and common points of contact. We mentioned just a few of the most significant. First of all, John was in the wilderness, as the Gospels attest, and the Qumranites did believe that they were ministering in the wilderness, as their own documents attest. Remember Luke's account of John's birth ends with this very unusual statement that the child grew, being strengthened in the spirit, and was in the wilderness until the day of his manifestation to Israel. How could this little child, the only son of aged parents, grow up in the wilderness? Well, as Josephus tells us, the Essenes were accustomed to take into their midst uh, orphaned children and teach them their ways, expecting them to live as members of the community. Number two, both John and the Essenes at Qumran believed that their actions were grounded in Isaiah's prophetic summons. Both um, parties quoted and elaborated upon Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, in the wilderness, preparing the way, uh, making straight in the desert a road for our God. And again, I have some other um, sources that apply to this particular topic, which will be posted on the website. The correspondence between the lifestyle and the teachings of the Qumran community and those of John the Baptist is impressive. Both observed strict dietary rules, both practiced ritual immersion, which was effective only after true repentance and a change of behavior was discerned. Both announced the coming of one greater to succeed them. Both were estranged from the Jerusalem temple. In fact, I think it's quite uh, possible that the moment that John breaks from the Qumran community is when he realizes that they're talking about two different messiahs, or actually three different messiahs. Two at Qumran, the messiah of Arad and uh, the messiah of Israel, and John is looking at the true and living Messiah. And then there are plenty of things to say about their estrangement from the Jerusalem temple. Uh, of course, there are significant differences between John and the Essenes at Qumran, but that to me is to be expected if John was among them and then broke from the community to follow a different way. And uh, of course, critics of the idea that John and the Essenes were associated rightly point out that John is never mentioned in the documents found at Qumran, but then again, neither are other specific individuals by name. In fact, you can look long and hard to find mention of the word Essene in the Qumran documents. Um, I guess in the end, I lean towards the view of German New Testament scholar Otto Betz that John probably grew up in the Essene community he responded to his special call from God. He became independent of the community to serve as the forerunner and, uh, and realized that what the Essenes were hoping to achieve was only possible by commitment to the true gospel of Mashiach, which I think is the way John would have referred to Jesus, and that discipleship to him brought true salvation. I want to just mention a word about John's mortal ministry, something that most of you are very familiar with. It seems to me that Luke attempts to pin down chronologically the beginning of John's public ministry by citing several historical markers. As Luke says in chapter 3, verse 2, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, number one, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, number two, while Pilate was governing Judea, number three, while Antipas was tetrarch of Galilee, number four, while his brother Philip was tetrarch of Etruria, and uh, 
the region of Trachonitis, uh, another tetrarch of, of uh, Abilene, and the interesting mention of Anas and Caiaphas, who were high priests. I think it's assumed that John's public ministry began at age 30. The Mosaic Law specified that Levites, which John was, should enter into their service at that age. But I think the important point that I would emphasize this afternoon is that generally speaking, before John baptized Jesus, he acted as a forerunner. After John baptized the Messiah, he acted in the role of a witness. The Synoptic Gospels seem to emphasize his work as a forerunner. The Gospel of John seems to emphasize his activity as a witness. And the Joseph Smith translation allows readers to see these distinctions more clearly, more discernibly than the Greek text. We can examine Matthew 3 and John 1 with their JST counterparts, which are very, very illuminating. Uh, and again, that, um, that double columned um, exhibit will be posted on the web. John's preparatory ministry focused on preaching repentance, baptizing penitents, and thus became a watershed mark in the early church. Take, for example, af the episode after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when they had to choose a new apostle. And Peter reminds the assembled group of the criteria that the candidate must possess. Quote, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. The baptism that John performed was very, very important, continued to be so as a marker. Also during his ministry, a point that I uh, would like to emphasize, uh, it seems to me we see John as one who is totally, sorry, we see John as one who is totally devoid of pride. Before John baptized Jesus, he was fearless in his denunciation of the self-righteous, errant ways of the Jewish leaders of society without any self-serving purpose. His single-minded objective was to prepare the Jewish people for the true Messiah, as Matthew records. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea went out to him and all the region around Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But seeing many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Children of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, not producing good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water to repentance, but one coming after me is stronger than me. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. During John's public ministry, John gathered to himself a group of personal disciples or followers, a task we would naturally associate with his role as forerunner or preparer. He prepared disciples who would then become disciples of the Lord Jesus. After John baptized Jesus, he continues to baptize others, but his efforts now switch to helping his followers transfer their allegiance to Jesus. And again, demonstrating a complete absence of self-serving purposes. Here is John's testimony, a powerful, powerful witness. This is John 3, 32 to 35. John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim because water was abundant there and people kept coming and were being baptized. John, of course, had not yet been thrown into prison. 
Now a discussion about purification arose between John's disciples and a Jew. They came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you testified, here, here he is baptizing and all men are coming to him. John answered and said, a man is not able to receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before that one. See, that's one of John the Baptist's favorite phrases to refer to the Messiah, that one. I am not that Christ. I've been sent before that one. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. It is necessary for that one to increase, but for me to decrease. I think that this is not just a demonstration of John's humility, nor his attempt to refocus allegiance of his own disciples to the Messiah. It is also an articulation of profound doctrine. It is necessary for that one to increase, but for me to decrease. Salvation is of Jesus Christ. Full and complete salvation comes by the authority and power of the Melchizedek priesthood. It does not come by John's authority or even the baptisms that he performed, though they are necessary. Salvation requires the full power of Christ and all must come to him, not to anyone else, but to him. Thus, as John stated, it was necessary for Christ for the authority that he possessed, the Melchizedek priesthood authority, the fullness of the priesthood, to increase, to become fully manifest. I want to uh, skip a little bit and talk a little bit about John's uh, death. Ooh, we're out of time. John was arrested, bound, and put into prison by Herod Antipas. We all know that because John forthrightly and boldly denounced the illegal marriage of Herod and Herodias, who was John, who was a Herod's brother's wife. Josephus' account reports the prison site as Machaerus, Antipas's palace. Some modern interpreters also believe that John was tortured owing to a phrase used later by Jesus, they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, Mark chapter 9, verse 13. And indeed it was not an uncommon practice for prisoners of that day to be tortured. John's gospel seems to emphasize, excuse me, Mark's gospel seems to emphasize John's death as much or more than his ministry. His death is presented between accounts of sending out the apostles and then their return. Perhaps this interrupted narrative was meant to underscore the potential of serving the Messiah, the potential cost of serving the Messiah. As the designated forerunner of the Messiah, John's death at the hands of wicked people foreshadowed the Savior's suffering and death. And it not only illustrates the hardships and violence many disciples of the early church would face, but it implies that there will be obstacles to the kingdom that all the righteous of every age even the most righteous will suffer. They will suffer injustice, hardship, and physical distress, not in spite of their faith, but because of their faith. Uh, Josephus's comments about uh, the death of Mark, uh, about the death of John, particularly as they are related to the Gospel of Mark, are worthy of our attention. We simply don't have the time, but I refer you to Antiquities of the Jews, 18 paragraphs, 116 to 119. Again, be able to find those on our website. Let me talk uh, in preparation for conclusion about John's ministry after his death. John's reputation did not die out after his death. The Acts of the Apostles describe a couple of instances. Uh, one of them 
was uh, the example of Apollos, who was described as an eloquent disciple and scholar of the scriptures, but who was acquainted only with the baptism of John. Therefore, he was taught more accurately the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, some 20 years after John's death, the Apostle Paul found some disciples at Ephesus who had not received the Holy Ghost, but had received only the baptism of John and therefore had to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ. From a third, fourth century text called the Pseudo Clementine Recognitions, we learn that John's disciples began claiming that their master was even greater than Jesus of Nazareth and was the true Messiah. All of this is to say that John's towering reputation lived long after him. The prophet Joseph Smith came to know a lot about John through direct revelation. And thus his resurrection ministry is of monumental importance. He was among the vanguard of restoration figures and of course was instrumental then in laying the foundations in two dispensations. One of the most important clarifications that the prophet Joseph Smith received uh, about the role of John the Baptist concerns his role as an Elias. And um, as we know uh, from a careful study of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible and sections of the Doctrine and Covenants like section 27 and others, we come to appreciate that Elias can be anyone sent from God in the spirit and power of an Elias. More than one person with a different proper name has also borne the title of Elias and has been referred to in scripture. Jesus identified John the Baptist as an Elias. And in the Joseph Smith translation of John 1, we learn that John the Baptist referred to Jesus as an Elias. And so we come to appreciate the fact that John held an important role or office in the kingdom as an Elias. Others have as well, too. While during his mortal ministry, John served in the role as an Elias of preparation, and after, he also serves in the role of an Elias of restoration. And uh, the role of Elias is not an inconsequential doctrine that comes to us as a result primarily of our examination of the New Testament. Well, in conclusion, and I realize I'm almost out of time. Thank you for your patience. Um, To emphasize that John was one of the greatest prophets who ever lived, I think we may turn to a quotation from the prophet Joseph Smith, who commented on Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 11. As John was imprisoned, and sent two of his disciples to Jesus to find out for themselves that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus turned to the crowds and taught them about John. Quote, What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Of that passage, the prophet Joseph Smith 
taught. There he teaches it. The question arose from the saying of Jesus, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. How is it that John was considered one of the greatest prophets? His miracles could not have constituted his greatness. First, he was entrusted with the divine mission of preparing the way before the face of the Lord. Whoever had such a, com a trust committed to him before or since, no man. Secondly, he was entrusted with the important mission, and it was required at his hands to baptize the Son of Man. Whoever had the honor of doing that, whoever had so great a privilege and glory, whoever led the Son of God into the waters of baptism and had the privilege of beholding the Holy Ghost descend in the form of a dove, or rather in the sign of the dove in witness of that administration. But the sign of, the dove, of a dove was given to John to signify the truth of the deed, as the dove is an emblem or token of truth and innocence. Thirdly, John at that time was the only legal administrator in the affairs of the kingdom there that was then on earth, and holding the keys of power. The Jews had to obey his instructions or be damned by their own law. And Christ himself fulfilled all righteousness and becoming obedient to the law, which he had given to Moses on the mount, and thereby magnified it and made it honorable instead of destroying it. The son of Zacharias wrested the keys, the kingdom, the power, the glory from the Jews by the holy anointing and decree of heaven. And these three reasons constitute him as the greatest prophet born of women. And I testify that that is true. Thank you.